Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls, and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, a series where I break down a classic Goosebumps book and any episode that goes along with it. I will also be telling up for Goosebumps cliches and classic moments. This week, I'm excited to visit The Abominable Snowman of Pasadena. I had forgotten all about this book, despite the memorable cover and batshit plot. It actually starts out as one of the stronger Goosebumps books, and then in the last 30th pages or so, Sai just goes nuts with random nonsensical events that really destroy the story. It's one you need to read to experience properly because it just gets so aggressively stupid. I think this is a great cover for a terrible book. I loved cryptids as a kid, so having what is basically a yeti on the cover had me sold. It's just fun getting to see the abominable snowman in sunny California. I do find the brown and blue to be a strange choice for this cover, but it's not the worst. The 2003 slime border is an improvement, I think. I like the pink and green combo, and it just seems to give more of a sunny California vibe that goes well with the overall story. It also centers the abominable snowman on the cover a bit more, which I think looks nicer. The 2015 cover is pretty decent, and it's nice getting to see another take on the abominable snowman himself. I think this snowman definitely looks meaner and ready to mess shit up, but we finally got some proper merchandise again after having a few weeks with not much. We have the Finger Frights Finger Ring, which is a tongue twister, of the snowman, and an abominable keyring that was actually part of a whole keyring set. This book also was included in a pack of mini puzzles, was featured on some different bookmarks, a hologram necklace like we've seen a couple times, and it was on something called a glow and tell card from Pizza Hut, where as far as I can tell, it's just a shadow puppet projection. Our front tag says, he's no fun in the sun, and our back tag says, Forget Frosty, our other famous snowman. Okay, let's read the blurb on the back. Jordan Blake and his sister Nicole are sick of the hot weather in Pasadena. Just once they'd like to have a real winter, a real winter with real snow. And then it happens, the Blakes are off to Alaska. Seems that Mr. Blake has been asked to photograph a mysterious snow creature there. Poor Jordan and Nicole, they just wanted to see snow, but now they're being chased by a monstrous creature, a big furry faced creature known as the Abominable Snowman. So let's start the summary. The book opens with our introduction to Jordan Blake, and he really romanticizes the idea of snow. It's not his fault though, Jordan's from Pasadena, California, and according to him he's never even felt cold, so this child's never experienced the joy of having to get out of your nice cozy warm bed in sub-zero temperatures. All of this is about to change though, because he's soon to be off on an Alaskan adventure with his photographer father. His dad has the dream job and basically gets to travel to various beautiful locations and just takes pictures of the wildlife. We meet Jordan's sister Nicole, who Jordan loathes. They have a mutual hatred though, and both make it their goal in life to make the other one wish they had never been born. Nicole's greatest crime appears to be that she's smart, so naturally Jordan is incredibly jealous. Nicole is so smart in fact that she skipped a grade and is now in the same classes as Jordan. Jordan also lets us know that Nicole has greenish blonde hair from spending so much time in chlorinated pools, which I didn't even know was a thing, so look at Stein teaching me shit. We then learn these children's parents are divorced, which we don't see often in Goosebumps, and their mom lives in Pennsylvania, so when their dad is out of town they have to stay with their neighbor Mrs. Hitchens, who sounds like a nightmare. This woman feeds these children liver, brussels sprouts, fish head soup, and a glass of soy milk every single night, which I think should be considered borderline child abuse. Their dad may be a great photographer, but he needs to work on titling his works because while developing his bear photos from Wyoming, he declares, I will call it the Brown Bears of Wyoming. Yes, that has a nice ring to it. Don't get too creative with it, dad. While developing these photos, disaster strikes. As the photos become clear, the family gasps in horror as there appears to be only photos of teddy bears, not brown bears. What could have happened? Turns out, Jordan is just a prankster and has taken photos with his dad's camera before they left, so it's just wild stuff. Apparently, pranking runs in the family because Jordan's dad loves playing pranks too, and we're treated to a prank story time about the time Jordan's dad had a magazine editor trick his friend into thinking he had been taking photos of gorillas, but instead had been taking photos of men in gorilla suits. Hilarious. And it was definitely worth the two pages it took to explain the joke. Jordan and Nicole leave the darkroom and wander out into their neighborhood, which sounds like it's been pulled straight out of Edward Scissorhands. The kids hate their boring suburban life and wish they had more adventures like their dad, preferably with snow because it's currently 100 degrees out. They stop at their friend Lauren's house, who's outside also currently complaining about the heat. They all relax by a tree when suddenly Jordan starts shrieking that he's been stabbed in the back by something cold in a chapter cliffhanger. This ends up just being a prank via the Miller twins, Kara and Kyle, who are two hellions who enjoy terrorizing the neighborhood and have just stabbed Jordan with a purple popsicle. The Miller twins seem to be less prankster and more just straight up neighborhood bullies who enjoy beating up kids and stealing their lunch money, so like classic bully behavior. Kyle then pulls out his super soaker through a series of very complicated hand moves that he claims Arnold Schwarzenegger taught him. Stein loves Arnold Schwarzenegger, he gets name dropped more than any other celebrity. The Miller twins hose down Jordan, Nicole, and Lauren, which they are very angry about, despite just complaining how hot they were a few pages ago. The Miller twins have also jacked up Jordan and Nicole's bikes by screwing the handlebars backwards. This sets Jordan off and he tackles Kyle to the ground only to end up getting pinned himself. Kara really escalates the situation and picks up a large rock, lifts it over her head, and drops it right into Jordan's forehead in a chapter cliffhanger. I was ready to see Stein dismiss this as some Looney Tune violence a la Evan and Monster Blood, but this ends up being a foam prop because the Miller twins' dad has connections to Hollywood, hence supposedly knowing Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
Jordan's dad appears on the scene and doesn't seem to notice that his child is currently being beaten up because he has exciting news to share. They're going to Alaska. Jordan is stoked and immediately starts talking about snow again. The dad then reveals his mission is to photograph something called the Abominable Snowman. And I enjoy that the dad is unfamiliar with the concept. He's acting like he'll just be photographing some new species of bear he was unaware of. The dad says even if he doesn't get some monster photos, the magazine will be happy to get pictures of the journey, and they're paying big, so it's a win no matter what. Again, this man is living the dream. He heads back inside, and the Miller twins proceed to mock the children some more. This results in a mini super soaker advertisement, where they chase each other around the yard having a blast. That is, until Nicole falls backwards into a compost heap. It should be noted Jordan had plenty of time to warn her, but he hates his sister and wanted to watch her suffer. We jump mid-flight on the journey to Alaska, where we hear even more about Jordan's love for snow. He just can't seem to get enough of the stuff, and is currently in awe as he stares out the window at miles and miles of it. He's even singing Christmas carols to himself over all this snow. They're going to be staying in a cabin way out on the tundra, and Jordan is low-key disappointed it's not an igloo because that would involve even more snow. We also learn that they're going to have a guide, Arthur Maxwell, to keep them safe out in the wilderness. The plane goes in for a landing when Jordan thinks he's spotted the abominable snowman already, and that the plane is just going to crash right into him in a chapter cliffhanger. This ends up being a polar bear statue, and honestly, he should be more afraid of polar bears than anything else out there. Those things are hungry and will fuck you up if given the chance. At the airport, they meet up with Arthur and learn that this airport is basically the town except for a local diner. Arthur wasn't expecting there to be two kids, so he's fairly standoffish towards the family. They all have some lunch and prepare to walk 10 miles to the cabin. The kids begin quizzing Arthur on the abominable snowman, and he lets them know he's personally never seen it, but he has heard stories, including one where the snowman picked up a sled dog and carried it off to eat it. Two guys from town went to rescue the dog, but never came back. So now, the family is questioning their decision to wander off to this cabin. They then learn that a couple of TV people from New York came out to film the monster, but they also never came back. One of them was found frozen to death, and the other presumably vanished at the hands of the snowman, who was spotted later hanging out in a pile of bones. The dad thinks these stories are just BS, so now Arthur is mad at the dad, but they head out into the tundra anyways. The kids are loving the snow for the first two miles with lots of snowball fights and snow angels, but the cold eventually sets in and Jordan has to brace himself for the next eight miles. Later, Nicole starts chasing Jordan with snowballs again, but this ends with Jordan accidentally walking backwards into a 20 foot deep crevice where he's saved by landing in a pile of snow. He tries to climb out but the walls are too steep and slippery. Lucky for him, Arthur appears with a rope and hoists him on out. I was thinking maybe Jordan would spot some signs of the snowman down there, but nope, we just reached the cabin as planned. The cabin is tiny and abandoned because nobody wants to use it anymore ever since there's been monster sightings. They all wake up the next morning to discover classic giant footprints in the snow like a proper Bigfoot. Arthur is freaked the fuck out and thinks that the abominable snowman will soon return to rip them to shreds, but Jordan is fairly nonchalant about it. That's because he faked the footprints. This little prank does not go over well with Arthur, and Jordan questions whether this man is stable enough to pull pranks on if he wants to reach age 13. They continue on their journey deeper into the tundra. While stopping to photograph a herd of elk, the elk suddenly get spooked and take off running. Arthur thinks this is a sign they should probably go back to town, but the dad refuses. They continue forward for a bit, then the sled dogs refuse to go any further. Arthur warns them that something dangerous must be on the snow rise ahead, and once again the dad is like, whatever, onward we go, but Arthur says fuck that and heads back to the cabin without the family. This forces the dad to retreat too, because he knows better than to wander off into the woods without his guide, but he's hopeful they can convince Arthur to return tomorrow. I'm not really sure what Arthur thinks he signed up for. Photographing the abominable snowman is obviously going to involve finding the snowman. Once back at the cabin, the kids spend some time gathering firewood and come across a frozen stream. This doesn't really go anywhere, and the kids return to the cabin. After dinner, they're all sitting quietly when the dogs start freaking out because there's something outside the cabin. Arthur and his dad go to investigate, but they conclude there's probably nothing out there. The dad then tells his kids he wants to go photograph the frozen stream they found at 8 o'clock at night when there's monsters nearby, and then leaves them alone in the cabin with Arthur. Arthur prefers the company of the dogs outside, so it's just the kids in the cabin, who of course can't stay put, so they put on their gear and head outside to make a snowman. Outside, they hear crunching behind the backside of the cabin, and when they go to investigate, they come across Arthur, who is in the process of loading up the supplies and escaping with the dogs. The kids chase after him, begging him to stop, but he's too fast and escapes via dog sled. The kids then realize they've run an awful long way, and they're not really sure which way the cabin is. It takes them a bit, but it occurs to them that they could just follow their own footprints back to the cabin. This goes well at first, but then it starts to snow harder and harder until they can barely make out their own tracks. As the kids are now running blindly in the blizzard, the ground suddenly gives away and they fall into another crevice. Once they land at the bottom, Jordan realizes this one's even deeper than the last one, and both kids are certain that dad will never find them now. You know, if he even notices they're missing, he's too busy photographing a frozen stream in the middle of the night. Nicole won't stop hollering for help, even though it seems to be triggering tiny avalanches. That is until she finally triggers a full-on avalanche into the pit in a chapter cliffhanger. They press against the wall as the pit fills with snow, when suddenly the wall gives way and they're sealed into some sort of cave tunnel. This book is actually pretty fun so far, with an exciting setting and decent tension, knowing that there's a monster lurking nearby. I just know that this book isn't very well regarded, so I'm kinda waiting for the shit to hit the fan, and not in a good way. 
The kids realize they can still see somewhat, so there must be a way out of this cave. They walk towards the light when they find themselves in a very large cavern. They're feeling hopeful, but that's when Jordan spots an enormous footprint, even larger than the one he faked earlier. They don't have much time to worry about this though because they immediately spot the actual abominable snowman himself. I glanced up. Nicole gasped. We both saw it at the same time. The creature. The abominable snowman. He loomed over us. He stood upright like a human, covered in brown fur. Black eyes stared out of an ugly face, half human, half gorilla. He wasn't that tall, about a head taller than me, but he seemed huge. His body was thick and powerful, with gigantic feet and fur-covered hands, as big as baseball gloves. The kids are frozen with fear when Nicole notices the snowman also appears to be frozen. They get a closer look and they realize that the abominable snowman is frozen in a solid block of ice. They don't really get how he managed to leave fresh footprints or how he came to be so perfectly frozen, but we just gloss over this. Since the snowman is frozen, Jordan's able to get an even better look at him. I backed away. It was too frightening, being this close to him, but the monster stayed perfectly still under the thick ice. Like the rest of his body, his hands were covered in brown fur. He had thick fingers like a man's. Jutting out of them were long, sharp claws. A chill ran down my spine at sighting those claws. What did he use them for? Ripping wild animals to pieces? Tearing up people who got in his way? He had powerful legs, with shorter claws on the toes. I studied his face. Fur covered his whole head except for a circle of hairless skin around his eyes, nose, and mouth. The skin was pinkish red. His lips were thick and white and set in a mean-looking grimace. The kids set to finding another way out of this cave since the avalanche blocked the main entrance. They spent some time messing with a crack in the wall, including karate chopping at it, but this gets them nowhere. There's a sudden loud crack that startles them, and they turn around and see that the snowman is busted out of the frozen ice. They're able to run a bit ahead before the snowman is fully free, but he's already in hot pursuit. The kids try hiding around the corner, but the snowman quickly finds them and attacks Nicole. The abominable snowman full-on grabs her by the head and lifts her up, which results in her screaming, help, he's crushing me, in a chapter cliffhanger. The snowman just ends up ripping off Nicole's backpack and tossing her aside. He then helps himself to some trail mix, which kind of perplexes the kids. Once out of the trail mix, the snowman gets grouchy again, so Jordan quickly hands over his backpack and trail mix. This works for a bit, but once again, once the snowman is out of snacks, he lunges for the kids. He lifts them up, and for a second, they think they're about to be eaten, but instead he stuffs them under his armpits and walks further into the cave. The snowman reaches a boulder, which he easily pushes aside to reveal a secret exit. The snowman then continues to carry them outside. A barking dog in the distance startles the snowman, and he gently sets them into the snow, and then they seize the opportunity to run towards the cabin, which they can now see because the blizzard is conveniently over. The snowman doesn't chase them, but once inside, their dad is nowhere to be found. The kids start to panic, think their dad must have gotten lost searching for them. Then they hear crunching outside, and they think the abominable snowman is back to finish what he started, but this ends up being the dad. This man has just been taking pictures of the frozen stream this whole time, and didn't even know that his kids were missing. They spend a chapter restating everything that just happened, and eventually lead him back to the cave they had just escaped. The dad is very eager to climb into this monster pit for some photos, without any sort of game plan for if the abominable snowman is hostile. The family ventures fully into the cave while the dad takes non-stop photos, and when they reach the snowman, he's entirely frozen all over again. The kids are amazed at how this creature can freeze himself so quickly, but not as amazed as they probably should be. The dad taps on the ice and decides he has an even better idea than just taking photos. He wants to King Kong this situation and bring the abominable snowman back home to California. Jordan warns that the snowman can pop out of the ice at any moment, but his dad assures him they'll keep them extra frozen this time. We're just throwing science out the window in general here because on top of somehow freezing into a literal solid block of ice in the span of like 30 minutes, the dad thinks that he'll just stuff this ice in a trunk and ship it home, and the trunk will be airtight so the ice won't melt. Yes, because that's how that works. We spend the next chapter using way more detail than needed by sawing out a giant rectangular block of ice, putting it in a trunk, loading it onto a dog sled, and heading back towards the cabin. Jordan even reopens the trunk to stash some snowballs in it so he can throw them at the Miller twins in Pasadena. Once at the cabin, the kids go to get some rest while the dad radios for help. When it's revealed that the radio is gone, except not really, he just forgot he hid the radio in his sleeping bag so it wouldn't freeze. I can see now that this book is losing some steam because the last 15 pages have been kinda pointless. We then take a big old time jump and we're now safely back in Pasadena, California, enjoying a 100 degree day. I guess we're just gonna drop the Arthur leaving the family to die storyline without any further explanation. Stein is unrelenting in this ice trunk stupidity, and we learn that they have it stored in a shed out back in secret, so no one knows they have a giant block of ice containing an abominable snowman just chilling in a shed that's magically not melted for the past week. Their dad emerges from the shed in full winter gear and announces he's off to meet with some scientists and won't be back until dinner, so stay out of the shed. Their friend Lauren is over again, so this of course leads to immediately going into the shed to show off the abominable snowman. Jordan of course wants to throw a snowball at her because he's been hyping this prank up to himself since Alaska. Once in the shed, Jordan opens the trunk and lets out a blood-chilling scream in a chapter cliffhanger. Shockingly, this is just another Jordan prank. He just wanted to keep the girls on their toes. They briefly show Lauren the snowman, and she's impressed that this wasn't all just bullshit. Before leaving the shed, Jordan passes Nicole a snowball to pelt at Lauren. And that's when this book takes a hard left into full-on what-the-fuck territory. Nicole throws a snowball but misses Lauren and hits a tree instead. However, instead of just going splat and melting, the snow starts to grow until it covers the entire tree. 
The magic snow then falls to the ground and begins growing there too. So this book is now about some sort of mutant snow that has the power to spread and grow in 100 degree weather. Lauren is dancing around in the snow and having a grand old time, while Jordan and Nicole watch with concern as the snow spreads across their yard. Lauren tosses some snow at a bush and it freezes it instantly. She then throws a snowball at Nicole, which causes her to become covered in snow and frozen solid. So the snow apparently only freezes things when thrown, because why isn't Lauren's ass frozen from playing in it? But Nicole gets hit by one snowball and it's instant freeze for her. Why didn't the snow freeze them in the cave in the first place? Was all of this written because Stein couldn't think of how to explain how the abominable snowman returned to being frozen solid so quickly in the caves? What is this plotline? But don't worry, it gets stupider. Lauren and Jordan proceed to drag his popsicle sister into the kitchen and place her next to the stove. They open the oven door and turn on all the burners in hopes that it will defrost her, but nothing happens. They then place her in front of a furnace at full blast and she still remains frozen solid. Jordan then remembers how warm the abominable snowman had felt when he carried them around, so he grabs some trail mix and races to the ice block to wake up the snowman. It's almost impressive what a nosedive this book took, and borderline offensive how stupid Stein must think kids are to accept this line of reasoning. Like, yeah, obviously we should wake up the snowman to save his sister from the magic snow, duh. Jordan waves around a bag of trail mix in front of the frozen monster, and surprise, the ice cracks and out pops the snowman. He takes some swings at Jordan, who takes way too long to realize that the snowman just wants the trail mix he was promised. The snowman eats the trail mix and then picks up frozen Nicole for a big ol' magic bear hug that defrosts her. Again, what is this storyline? We went from an Alaskan monster adventure with some decent tension in a creepy setting, to magic snow and a yeti who can defrost with the power of hugs. Nicole is like, golly thanks Mr. Monster for saving my life, and then they all step outside into the sun. They somehow forgot that the yard was frozen because it's quite the shock for all of them for some reason. The snowman emerges from the shed and beelines it for the frozen tree, where he proceeds to give it a magical healing hug. The tree defrosts and then the snowman begins rolling in the yard to defrost all the grass too. I know Stephen King did a lot of coke in the 80s when he wrote some of his stories. Do we know what Stein got into in 1995? The snowman has now successfully melted all the snow, looks up and shrieks at the sun as if he's just realized he's no longer in Alaska, and takes off running down the street in search of somewhere cold, presumably. The kids spend some time lamenting how pissed their dad's gonna be once they realize he lost the snowman. They go into the shed to dispose of the magic snowballs, but don't know the safest way to do it. The trio settles on burying the snowballs in an empty lot next door, and just as they finished up, the dad returns home asking how his snowman is doing. I like that the crisis became, what do we do with these snowballs? You know, instead of like, oops, we released a yeti into Pasadena. We jump to dinner time and the kids have broken the news to their dad that they lost the snowman. The dad has to keep reminding himself that the important thing is that the kids are safe, but you can tell he'd rather have the yeti than them. He goes to develop his Alaska photos and discovers every photo of the abominable snowman hasn't turned out properly and are just showing pictures of snow instead. We're at the last two pages, so I guess we're just going with the abominable snowman escaped Pasadena somehow and headed for some nearby mountains without further event. Jordan and Nicole head outside and spot the Miller twins digging in the empty lot because they must have been spying earlier. Before Jordan can stop him, Kyle grabs a magic snowball and throws it at Kara as our shocker ending. And that's how this one ends. What an impressively bad book. The abominable snowman of Pasadena didn't get an episode because the snowman himself proved too hard to pull off, so instead I'll be doing Click, and no, not the Adam Sandler one, although it's a very similar plot. When the remote control arrives, Seth discovers that as well as electrical appliances, it can also control the world around him. However, this newfound control proves addictive, and soon Seth is abusing it. Our notable actor again is Danny Wary Smith, who we last saw in Attack of the Mutant, so let's start the episode. 30 seconds in, and this child is already our fashionista. Mom told you to quit ordering junk out of that magazine. I mean, it does look pretty exciting for a remote. Possess ultimate control. I like episodes that just jump right into it. Program to bring you this important message from Armchair Electronics. Hello. Please follow all instructions and warnings carefully. And now back to our. I thought he was gonna mute her instead of pause. <laughs> Jamie. Jamie. He says it's not a toy, but it seems like it'd be pretty fun to me. It's not a toy. Memory unlocked, I used to also love messing with the color settings on the TV as a kid. Oh, cool. This is amazing. <laughs> At least he's undoing his chaos and not full on evil yet. <laughs> I like that he explained eject because I did not get that at first. Whoa! Cool eject! This episode is a lot more creative than I anticipated. I figured we'd just have pause, rewind, and fast forward. Oh! I'm sorry you didn't answer that in the form of a question! Mothers! <laughs> oh! 
<laughs> Hello, friend. This is some technology. Do use the XG. This is more in line with what I was thinking you would do throughout the episode. Studying is a thing of the past. Here it is. This test will be a breeze, Cap. Peace on Earth at last. Now I hope during this brief time out, you'll chill a little bit. Good thing he put that together or we'd never recognize it. This doesn't seem wise. What an awful ringtone. Looked pretty effective to me. Looks like it fits in here. What was that? This family is very okay with just blacking out for 12 plus hours. Sorry, Jamie. Don't even think about it. I'm starving. Have we had dinner yet? Fatal mistake. Come to Papa. <laughs> it's like the ring. It corrupted Seth. I gotta get rid of that thing. It's changed you. Maybe you did, but you weren't quick enough. Seth, you're being a jerk. Now give me. Fuck him up, Seth. Seth. Ugh! Try that again. You'll really be sorry. Clicking power was a choice. He could have just killed him. Give me the remote, Seth. Back off. Now Seth gets to live in purgatory. Oh no. Battery low? No, Tony, wait! All I need are some batteries! Overall, I thought The Abominable Snowman of Pasadena was one of the more disappointing books so far. It started out strong with a fun premise and some nice tension with a family being stalked in the Alaskan wilderness, but after the kids escaped The Abominable Snowman the first time, the book just goes to shit. It felt like Stein was tossing nonsense in the book and being like, deal with it, kids won't know any better. I finished this book somewhat annoyed because it really went off the rails for no discernible reason. It's like two completely different ideas for books were smashed poorly into one. I'm going to give this one 2 out of 5 snowballs. If it hadn't started out so strong, it would be an easy 1 star book. Okay, on to our totals. The Abominable Snowman of Pasadena didn't have any vomit, shoulder scares, or it was only a dream, but it did have some 90s moments. In Getting Jiggy with the 90s, we had two 90s moments. These included Arnold Schwarzenegger and Super Soakers. This raises our total to 131 Jiggy 90s moments. In It's a Prank Bro, I counted five pranks. These included teddy bear photographs, getting stabbed with a popsicle, a rock skull smash fake out, fake footprints, and a yeti scream fake out. This brings our series total to 95 It's a Prank Bro. The Bomble Snowman had a decent amount of chapter cliffhangers with a total of 13, and I thought they were fine in general. This raises our Goosebumps total to 470. The clicky cliffhanger award for this book has to be chapters 21 to 22, where, oh no, Arthur stole the radio. Oh wait, it's just in a sleeping bag, duh. We had a return of the asshole victim, with Kara getting frozen by a magic snowball, which for some reason became the main focus of the book during the last few chapters. This raises our total to 23 asshole victims. Shocker ending. Our big twist for this book was Kyle pegging Kara with one of the magic snowballs on the last page. It's stupid, and it's weak, but it's still a twist. This brings our Goosebumps series total to 31. Well that's it for the Abominable Snowman of Pasadena. I really didn't expect to hate this one as much as I did, so it kinda caught me off guard. Next week is how I got my shrunken head, and I remember this being another adventure story, and I recall it involving quicksand. Let me know in the comments what you thought of the Abominable Snowman of Pasadena. Did you hate this one as much as I did? What are your thoughts on Ghost Riders? Do you believe in Bigfoot? Also, what did you think of my cryptid horror clips this week? Anyways, as always, thanks again for watching, and make sure you subscribe for... The Brad. The Love. <laughs>